So the, I, I want you to understand that the word about life, uh, I know it may be hard to believe, but um, there is some thought that's given to all of this um, before Saturday night. And, um, and yet it always is amazing to me the way the spirit of life and love will bring things together. And so here is a word about life. The Japanese proverb, the nail that sticks out gets hammered down. And then from Proverbs, even fools are thought wise if they keep silent and discerning if they hold their tongues. And then from Kathy King's book, Raise Your Voice, Why We Stay Silent and How to Speak Up. Learning to use your voice is about understanding how we each are created in God's image. It's about the space in which gender, faith, ethnicity, and race converge, adding to the power and beauty of individual voices effectively impacting and shaping the church and the world. It's about knowing deeply how God sees you, grounded in the truth that we are all created in God's image, and using your voice in word, deed, and art to communicate the good news in a messed up world. May the spirit of life and love bless the reading, the hearing, and the living of this word about life. Amen. Last week, uh, we began a small sermon series called Raise Your Voice. My, message, my messages are inspired and informed by Kathy Kang's book, Raise Your Voice. We began last week with some storytelling about Esther. We ended the message by saying Esther could not raise her voice until she found her voice. She found her voice when she came to understand that she had a unique time and place in history. For such a time as this, she was born to raise her voice for her people's sake. So before we raise our voice, we must find our voice. Our voice is more than our vocal cords. Our voice is our identity, our words, and our actions. We have in our covenant, our statement of faith as Shadow Rock, the phrase that we will balance our proclamation of the word about life with the deeds that make life good. We think that our voice is only about our vocal cords, but it is more than that. Our voice is our influence in our interaction with our neighbors. Our voice is the embodied integration of our proclamation with our deeds. When our voice springs out of our values of inclusion, justice, and spirituality, we echo the deep goodness of life. We echo God's character. We echo Jesus' good news to all people. Our voice is both the proclamation and good deeds. In our limited and finite existence, Word and deed are separate, and we must be intentional about integrating them, putting them together. For God, word and action are the same. God speaks, and the action of creation and the creation of action happens at the same time. Let there be light. Such wholeness is the goal when we raise our voice. Some preschool parents are concerned about our proclamation of the word about life and our deeds to make life good. 
especially as we apply it to our ministries to immigrants, refugees, and asylum seekers. I understand their love for their children and fierce desire to protect their children. I want to do everything to protect them and assure the parents. Most parents also want to have all these ministries on the same campus, believing their children are better human beings because we live out our values with integrity. As far as we know, all the parents love our work and believe it is the right thing to do. They want the work to be done. However, a few do not want the work to be done here through us. The parents who do not want to share our campus with other ministries, especially Sanctuary and Hope Station, believe they are perfectly within their rights as consumers and concerned parents to ask us to stop those ministries. They do not understand that they are asking us to shut down our voice. They do not understand that our ministry to children in our preschool and our ministry to children in families seeking asylum spring out of the same values, spring out of the same vision, spring out of the same mission of what it means to be Shadow Rock United Church of Christ. To shut down one because of the other would be to shut down our integrity with our proclamation of the word about life and our deeds that make life good for every life. To shut down one because of the other would be to lose our voice and shut us up. I want to be clear. We did have two families that left and we were able to fill those spots with our waiting list. We do not have families leaving. We do have families expressing their concern and we hear their concerns. And this was movement, action, conversation, discernment, planning, implementation, all before yesterday. Yesterday puts an exclamation point on it. Now the board has spent a lot of time talking about the Shadow Rock brand. What is our brand? How do we market our brand? How do we sell ourselves so that we grow and expand our capacity to sustain and thrive? This is often seen as voice, the throat chakra, and a megaphone of social media, the Moon Valley Tadler, radio and TV. This is a good discussion for us to have, and we need to figure this stuff out. However, we need to be careful. Our true voice is not our vocal cords. It is our heart. Our true voice is not a megaphone of technology or social media but the way we love our neighbor. Our true voice is not a brand. It is an identity. We are first and foremost human beings reflecting the image of God. Before this truth is a proclamation, it is a deep core identity and a hard and fast reality. We are the Imago Dei. We are the image of God, individually and collectively. When we raise our voice out of this identity, we become proclamations and deeds of healing, hope, justice, and beauty for people living in pain, despair, anger, fear, and loneliness. Is this not what all our ministries attempt to do? Is this not what we attempt to be for one another? All our ministries and all our people are the raised voice of Shadow Rock, a voice for peace and justice. In the context of raising our voice, I want to speak to the shooting at the synagogue in Pittsburgh. 
The good people of the Tree of Life congregation need our prayers and our voice. There have been hundreds of school shootings and scores of active shootings at places of worship. That is the new reality. That many of the statistics actually start in 1999 with the shooting at Columbine High School. There is a list. I won't read that to you. You can go online and find it. But trying to figure out how to speak to this, the vehicle of a sermon didn't seem right. I wanted it to be more intimate. And so I wrote a letter. Dear friends, we are saddened by another mass shooting. We will be intentional about holding space in our hearts, minds, and prayers for the good people of the Tree of Life Jewish congregation. While all the violence and the moral and physical injury it causes horrifies us, there is something about yesterday's shooting that may hit us a little closer to home emotionally. We are mindful of the Jewish congregation that meets on our campus. They are our friends. And they worship under our roof. We hear their rabbi chant the Psalms. We see their youth move around the campus and we eat their kosher hot dogs. We want to protect all people, but we feel especially protective of the people who share our home. The shooter was vehemently anti-immigration. He made no distinction between refugees, undocumented people, sanctuary leaders, and asylum seekers. They were all quote-unquote hostile invaders that deserved to die. And anyone who was kind to them and offered hospitality to the stranger, according to our faith, they deserved to die as well. For the shooter, it was kill or be killed. Who is he talking about? Who is he wanting dead? Remember Misiel Perez? Remember Ishmael Delgado? Do you know Sixto and his son, Ian? Do you know Abet and her beautiful, smart, funny children? The shooter wants them dead. Do you know Herb and Mike, who prepared and served food? Do you know Sherry, who did laundry? The shooter wants them dead. Do you know Dr. Patricia and Rita Rainwater, who tended to their hurts and illnesses? The shooter wants them dead. We could go on and on because haters gotta hate, and when you hate this much, you don't just hate some people, you hate all of life. And you wanna see the whole world die. In 2008, a shooter walks into a Unitarian Universalist church in Knoxville, Tennessee. The shooter targeted the church because, quote, of its liberal teachings and his belief that all liberals should be killed because they were ruining the country, unquote. The shooter also targeted the church because he felt it was a cult that worshiped the God of secularism. Trying to discern God's newest thrust in history is trying to live true to our values. And when we do this, there are some things that some people may not like. We are open and affirming of LGBTQA and I human beings. We produce hospitality, we provide hospitality and hope to migrants. 
We find joy in sharing our campus with progressive Catholics and Reformed Jews. And we are one of the most theologically liberal congregations you will ever find. We are providing lots of reasons for some people to hate and fear us. So what do we do from here? Should we be quiet? Should we shrink our presence? Should we decrease our work? Should we lose our voice and just shut up? Perhaps we should give the Jewish congregation notice. Perhaps we tell ICE we don't want any more asylum-seeking families and give Sixto and a bet notice. Perhaps we should firm up our loosey-goosey liberal theology and become a bit more defined, a little more rigid, a little more orthodox. If we do these things, we will leave a much smaller footprint. We will not be the nail that sticks out looking for someone to come and hammer us down. We will be forgotten we will fall off society's radar screen. We will become incredibly mediocre. And we will probably be safer for it. If we lose our voice and just be quiet, then we will not call attention to ourselves. This might be smart and a life of fear. But it is a life, and better than being dead. Or is it? Or is it? As your pastor, should I be quiet? Am I making us more vulnerable as I speak for justice and inclusivity? If so, what right do I have to do so? I have thought most of my life that God had a claim on me and in order to be true to my vows, I had to raise my voice. And this was easy. It was an easy task when the only thing at risk for me was losing my job. However, things feel different now. In the week of pipe bombs and a shooting in a synagogue, we need to be a lot more intentional about our faith, about our voice, about our choices, about our risks, and our security. And so I leave you with the question. Should we be smart and live in fear? Because, after all, isn't living better than being dead? Or is it? Amen.